While the video game industry is barely half a century old, there have been a slew of video game consoles that have passed through our homes, and the homes of generations before us. Some of them ring a bell of nostalgia, others, well, we'd probably rather forget them. Today we are taking a walk down memory lane, taking a look at those awful atrocities that call themselves consoles, specifically focusing on one of the biggest reasons why people have disowned them, their controllers. So here is our list of the top 10 worst video game controllers. Number 10, N64. While this may be an unpopular opinion because of how much those who had an N64 adored it, just consider the anatomy of the system's controller for a sec, compared to that of the controllers we have nowadays. There's a reason why controllers are two pronged, not three. And perhaps that's something that people realized after using the N64 controller when it was first introduced in 1996. The analog stick was included on the controller to better navigate 3D spaces in games, which was great, but there was no way to not awkwardly alternate between the stick and the D pad. Moving on to something much less controversial. And much more ridiculous, and at number 9 is Atari Mindlink. The 1984 Atari Mindlink was pretty darn innovative for its time. If innovative, Really meant full of shit, that is. So, the whole concept behind this one was to put this electronic headband on your noggin and use your mind to control what happened on your screen. Really, what it did was read the muscles in your forehead and react accordingly using an infrared transmitter and an infrared receiver for the Atari 2600. Sounds like a recipe for disaster, and it was, hence why it was never actually released. According to one of the engineers, Bill Lapham, after about 10 minutes of use, a person's muscles would overdrive the system. It was brought around to different gaming expos that year, but never actually tested by anyone outside of the Atari development team. Team. Up next, number eight, the Nokia Engage. It's a phone. It's a game. It's both. And yes, this sucker right here owned one. Yep, that's right. Yours truly had a Nokia Engage, and you know what? I loved it. Despite my own affinity for this poorly designed system, the Nokia Engage was a bit of a confusing piece of technology that didn't do overly well in the market. It functioned pretty awkwardly as a cell phone. I'd always have to use speakerphone now that I recall. And for games, the keypads were really clunky, since, you know, we had all those numbers there. It made for a better gaming experience than a cellular one, but hey, screw it, I still liked it. To be fair, I was 13, so cut teenage me some slack. And at number seven, the Microsoft Kinect. The most recently released entry on this list, the Microsoft Kinect seemed like a really good idea in theory, but in execution, it was anything but. Essentially, it was a motion sensor device that meant you didn't need to use a physical controller to operate your Xbox 360 or Xbox One consoles, except it just didn't really work very well. Aside from having a poor selection of games in its roster, it didn't adapt well to individual surroundings, meaning it didn't operate well in low light or in different living spaces. When the sales were doing poorly, Microsoft started including the Kinect in packages with the Xbox One and hiked the price of it all, making people less inclined to want to own the system, and it sold half the number of units as Sony's PS4 did. In at number six, the E-Dimensional Access Controller. This controller felt like one giant shape sorting toy. The idea behind it came from a good place. It was a build your own controller, which, yes, can be pretty appealing depending on the kinds of games you play, but it felt more like a keyboard than a controller. The layout was too wide, yet it marketed itself as a game hack controller that allowed you to play with one hand. That being said, it was a useful tool for those with disabilities, who are unable to play with two hands, yet the design was still really difficult and clunky for it to really be all that efficient. Up next at 5, the Philips CDI 400 controller. Feeling more like a TV remote than part of a game console, this sad little excuse from Philips is the one-handed garage door opener of controllers. Aside from looking terrible, Terrible functionality wise, the button placement was awkward, and turns out it broke down really easily. The Philips CDI overall was a weird invention. It had an emphasis on education games and board game adaptations, and just couldn't compete with the bigger gaming consoles. In our number 4 spot, the Atari 5200. The Atari 5200 controller basically looks like an ancient cell phone with a weird twisty fob. Coming off of the Atari 2600 controller, it felt like a real step back. The joystick was a 360 degree non centering joystick that was meant to offer more control, but despite that, what failed was the poor number number pad design beneath it, and is clunky and redundant. The only benefit of this controller was its introduction of the pause button, something that many other controllers in the future would also add to their system. And our number 3 spot is the Atari Jaguar. So if that last number wasn't bad enough, Atari released a system with another awful controller that hit the shelves of stores in 1993. The Atari Jaguar was a problematic system in general, which sucks, because it was actually pretty hyped. It was the only system at the time that could play 64 bit. Yeah, once upon a time that was a thing. So what went wrong? Its multi-chip architecture, hardware bugs and barely any developer support made it really difficult for third party developers to make games for it. With only 56 games available, it led to low sales. Even if all of that wasn't a factor, its controller was just odd. It was 
circular, had the same failings as the 5200 with this number pad, and just wasn't something that was really appealing to use. Up next, number two, the Intel Wireless Series Gamepad. You can't help but look at this gamepad and wonder how in the hell anyone let this thing get to the market. It looks like one of those neck pillows that you bring onto planes for long flights. Now imagine playing a game with it, and how awkward and distracting the weight would be when trying to play any sort of genre. That's a double edged sword. The button placement was also counterintuitive, existing on the very tips of the controller's end, which made it incredibly difficult to maneuver, considering it's also made by Intel. Which is a company notorious for developing software that is anything but interesting, although incredibly useful. It should be no surprise that this controller fell off the radar pretty darn quick. And lastly, in our number one spot, the Power Glove for the NES. In the days of VR gaming, a game glove isn't something that is a total long shot. But back in 1989, when it was released, this controller didn't take overly well. Used on the NES, the actual glove itself was never designed by Nintendo, but rather a group called Abrams Gentile Entertainment. It was released by Mattel rather than Nintendo. It had 256 Six movements that players could perform in order to play games, most of which were incredibly contrived and a little overly complicated compared to other controllers' basic button commands. Aside from that, the glove had many issues. Its motion sensors rarely worked with your television, or flat out just didn't connect. Plus, the buttons were placed really awkwardly. Alright, there we have it, friends. Which of these consoles do you hate the most? If you never played on any of them, which one would you actually want to try, just for the hell of it? Let us know in those comments below. If you dug this video, please spread the love by hitting that like button, and subscribe if you want to hang out with us some more. There's also a whole a lot of other crappy controllers we didn't touch on, so if you want to see a part 2 of this list, also give us a shout about that. And if that's not really your thing, well we've got a bunch of other gaming videos just waiting for you to watch. So definitely give that playlist flashing on your screen a look right now. In the meantime, thanks for watching everybody, catch you all in the next one.